everybody, I am Cinnamon Cooney, your art sherpa, and today I'm so excited to be showing you step by step how to paint this fantastic fall landscape. It's totally and fully focused on the beginner art experience, so I'm going to explain to you every part of the color mixing, every part of the technique. If you check the description below, you're going to see all the colors listed down there, but you're also going to see a link to my website. On my website are more fully explained step-by-step -step pictures. And this step-by-step -step guide will help you follow along without having any worry or anxiety. On the mic is my husband, John. Hey, guys. He is going to be getting us through this and making us sure that this is a really fantastic, fun painting. You're going to see a lot of fun shenanigans, even a funny thing with some bubbles. You'll have to tell me at the end in the comments if you saw what happened. All right. So I'm ready to show you how to do this painting. Get your paint, get your brushes, come back and meet me at the easel right now. Let's get started. All right. Okay, everybody, let's look at the materials we're going to be using in today's lesson. But first, I want to tell you something really important to keep in mind. Don't skip this project because you don't have an exact color. Very often, you can exchange colors in and out. In painting, the value of something is way more important. That means how light or dark it is. So if you have a close approximation to the colors I'm using, go ahead and use them anyway. Now here I have a nine by 12 artist panel. This is made for acrylic painting and on it, as we like to do, I have some wishes and intentions. And these are kind of like this fall blessing. May you love deeply. May you be loved. May you be healthy and may you be happy. So often I'm sure many of us go through the art journey to try to be more happy. Don't you think so, John? Oh yeah. Yeah. In our experience, many, many people take up painting initially because they're just trying to feel better in their lives. So I definitely wish that for you in this project. Now our colors today are cad red medium, cad red light. If you didn't have cad red light, you could just use any orange you have. I have a uh, pansy yellow medium. I normally use cadmium yellow, but I'm out right now. And so I exchange for pansy yellow. Uh, phthalo blue, quinacridone magenta, dioxazine purple, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, titanium white, and I haven't put it out yet, but also we're going to need a little black, right? So there's a little carbon black, but you could use Mars black. You know, if you go to the website and you check down, you look down, you're going to see a color exchange list. Those colors aren't exactly the same, but they work well in the mixes that I'm doing and they'll give you a great result. So again, don't let the little stuff like slow you down and, hic and give you hiccups because today's the day you're going to paint a great painting. Now, to get rid of these watercolor words, I, I use watercolor pencil, and as you can see, that allows me to take just a damp brush and brush those away. I try to use colors that won't uh, give me any trouble on the painting as I go and do it. So this particular background, I think, is pretty friendly to new artists. I'm using a number 30 short handle brush. All you've got to do when you paint in the background is just use a big chunky brush that you have. Now to start this, I'm going to begin with a little bit of blue. So I'm going to dip my brush in water, drag off the extra. And what I do first is load up in white because I want my color to be quite light. See, I'm flipping the brush. I'm going to come get a small amount of the blue. Look, that gives me a very light color. And I'm going to bring the blue across my surface. Let's get a little more. Sometimes it can be hard to get ample paint into our painting, which is can be. All we're trying to do is create a really fun kind of fantasy fall sky, the perfect sky for fall. I'm just picking up more white paint. I'm making sure that the surface is covered amply. Now I am going to rinse out and then I'm going to do a transition. And the transition is going to be into my magenta. But I'm going to come and load this into my brush first, loading it in amply. John always likes to catch how I'm loading it so you guys can see that at home. And it's you're really little... good at that, babe. Well, I, I think it's just, this is part of the, you know, how you load the brush is an important part of that first lesson, you know. I when think so. You spend a lot of time mixing just as an obs observation. And... I do. <laughs> we well, talk about that a lot. I'm blending this down into the blue. When these two get together, they're going to make a purple. Yeah. Yeah. I do spend a lot of time mixing. Now here, babe, if you see this, and if you guys at home see this, as long as this is still wet, these two edges will blend together, and a little purple band will show up. Isn't that nice? Yeah. 
kind of gives you a nice little transition. You can always grab a little more blue if you want to exaggerate the purple band. And sometimes people do because it's sort of pretty when it does that. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Makes a nice transition. And I think that that's a beautiful, attractive sky that any fox or wild animal or human person would enjoy. So I was thinking about the other day, if like I did a sky like this and I saw it outside, like, would I be like, ooh, or would it be like, ooh, that's weird. Just a weird thought that I have. I'm going to dry this, and this is going to be step one. So if you're using the step-by-step -step that we mentioned, this is going to be step one on that. So this is the first stage for you to get to. Now for step two, we're going to put in the landscape and the base of our tree. We're not going to do all the finishing parts of it. It's just going to be the beginning blocking in. And to do that, I'm going to come over here with my number eight cat's tongue. Now, you don't have to use this brush exactly, um, though you can find it in many, many locations. You could also use a big round or big filbert or big bright. This is just about being able to paint in the landscape, which is going to be a little bit of black and a little bit of brown mixed together into a deep, dark chocolate. Sometimes you'll see me add a little bit of water to my mix to thin my heavy body paint. Now, I'm going to come over here about three fingers to the left hand side and I'm going to wander it down to about one finger on the right hand side and I'm going to just bring this down um, that would be my finger like if you used uh, my husband's finger that would be too big a finger Might be. <laughs> so if you have big hands you may want to do just a little bit less or you could use the grid that we have with the mapping option will help you know how big things are on relationship in the canvas definitely definitely take absolute advantage of those wonderful free tools that can help you succeed at your painting. Now, after I get that in, I'm gonna do a very next important part. I'm gonna grab a little bit of my black and brown together, and I'm gonna put it on the toe of this brush because it's gonna give me a nice line. If you don't have a brush like this, what I would suggest is you switch to a round, something that gives you a nice point when you're doing the grass. And as I'm going here, I'm gonna have John zoom really into what I'm doing. And I want you to notice that I curve my grass different directions, right? Like we might blow some down and then we bring it back up. And this sort of energy gives the grass a lot of life to it and helps it really, really bring energy to your painting. Taking that all the way across. And again, you could do that with just a round. Once I have that in, I'm going to rinse out a bit. And I'm going to grab a little bit of my burnt sienna and my yellow ochre mixed together. This is the start of my dry grass color. Because I've got to kind of get a background going back here before I put my tree in. So some of this is best to do early on. I can always come back with my detail brush to make some detail bits. But I want to make sure that my tree is layered in front of some beautiful, beautiful grass. So I'm layering this lighter color over the top. And you can see that makes some of the grass seem like it's in shadow. And I'm just bringing some upwards. And blending it over. And you can always take this sort of through your whole piece at the beginning. We'll still have so many more layers. We'll have an easy time layering the tree, but it will help you in making a more complete sort of rustic hill. Yeah, the, these layers seem to be important to create the dimension. They really are. They're what pulls a whole painting together. And honestly, they're the fun part of the painting once you know they're supposed to be there. So I think it, you can kind of see how it's rough. It's not that perfect. It's not that exact, right guys? But it does look very flowing and natural. And that is the important part. Take a deep breath, let it out. And let me show you how you can use the round brush to put in the beginning of your tree. I like to put my tree in early, some of the trunk. Otherwise, I find my leaves tend to go everywhere. And I'm going to use my brown and black again, almost pure black, but I want that chocolate brown edge to it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a little stroke up that comes up here and kind of wanders over that way. So I always call this planting the tree. When I go like that, this is where I've decided to plant this tree. 
and then I'm going to wind it over and then come like that. I don't want to put in every branch or every part of the trunk yet. And that is because I have lots of layers that need to be underneath it. So anything I put in at that stage would definitely, definitely end up be taken out by the subsequent layers of the painting. As John was mentioning. Yeah. But it's a good time to get a nice stable trunk in. And you'll see me dip my number four round in water. And kind of bring that down. I think it's nice to sort of flare the trunk out in a few places. And while I'm here, I'm going to rinse out. And I'm going to get a little bit of water. I'm going to load up some of my orange. I'm going to get it over to my brown. And it makes kind of a burnt orange color. You can even get a little yellow into it. We're making this really gorgeous dry grass. So take a few seconds and go ahead and add this little background layer. Now that you have the tree and you can kind of see where you might want to put in a few details. Yeah. And the details are everything. Now we will have some dark grass that we're going to add to this whole mix. But right now at this stage, we're just getting in the beginning of what we have going on. I'm not going to put my grass yet in front of my trunk because I have lots of bark and things I want to add to my trunk. Right. I'm just creating this layer a bit as we go. And we're going to layer it with a lot more gold so that our red fox shows even though he's quite well camouflaged. Now for the next part, I'm going to use this number four round again. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the tree shape. And I'll use some chalk here because it's super easy to erase. Overall, the tree shape travels like this and goes down and comes up. It has sort of an S curve to it. And we want to make sure that whatever we've got going on, that we pay attention to that. Now, if you're using the traceable, all of that has been worked out for you. But if you're using the grid or you're just painting along with me, it's just good to be aware of where that's going to be. Okay. So once we have that all done, we're ready to move on to the next step, which is our tree. I'm really excited about this. We're going to put in a bunch of leaves and we're going to pay attention to a couple of things. Now, I'm going to use my number eight cat's tongue for this just to get a large amount of the work in. And then I'm going to reduce it down to my number four round to get the more detailed, delicate leaves. To begin, I'm going to grab a little of my cad red medium and I'm going to mix it into my doxazine purple so that it looks like a deep fall color underneath the tree. Now I'm going to show you something just real quick. I'm going to use my paint to do it. You don't have to follow me, but I'm going to make a little S curve. And that's going to help me think about where my leaves in the major part of my tree are going. Mm. Now to get the base tree shape, I'm taking my brush and on the corner of it, I'm just tapping it down to create the base that I'm going to be putting all my delicate leaf shapes on. See how we're doing? Just yeah. little, little marks. I can paint right over the trunk because I'm going to be putting it back with more layers of paint after I'm all done with my leaves. Now as we come down, sometimes it can be nice to bring some of this color a few places and even remind ourselves that we're going to be taking some leaves all over. Just pulling this down here. This is the basis. You can even get it deeper because in the depth of the tree, it would be quite dark. And purple does the nicest base for a fall tree. Yeah. Yeah, I really love it. I feel like the, the colors often play against each other. And you're going to see me Probably pull it down to at least here. Just the beginning before I begin the process of all the little bright leaves. I'm going to make sure that I'm thinking about how some of that might go. So 
putting a little tendril there. And this is the beginning of putting a little tendril here. So it's an interesting shape. You can kind of see where it goes in and out. Those first little traverses into shape help inform me that my tree isn't going to be like a lollipop or a solid surface. Once you get that base of purple down, it's important to let it dry before the next layer. If you'll check the website, I have a little graphic there explaining more about this shape. That way, if you're really new to painting and these shapes are a little uncomfortable or awkward at first, you have that extra anchor to help you and reduce anxiety and really show you a path through. Now I'm going to get my number four brush and I'm going to begin the process of many, many leaves. Sometimes it helps me to change the orientation of my surface so that I'm pulling my strokes instead of trying to drag them out. So I'm going to be pulling these towards me and I'm going to begin with just a really nice pad red. It's okay if you want to vary up the tone by adding a little bit of the docks purple and then going to the pure bright. But mostly what you're wanting to do is to pull these little strokes in. So you see I'm making little touches, little tiny touches. I think it's always nice to put a few little leaves that have loosed themselves from the tree. Oh, yeah. And are pulling forward. Now, I know John loves these fall trees so much. Oh, yeah. I love them. I think it's your favorite season that we paint. Yeah, I think it may be. I really do like these. I like the multi. I, I really like this foxy tree. I'm very excited about the fox. I don't think I'm going to have enough foxes in my system this holiday. I don't know how many foxes are coming. But for sure, more foxes will be happening. So you can see right there how I'm putting in these beginning brush strokes and how I'm making little tree shapes as I go. Even when we're painting a fantasy tree like this, we can totally pay attention to some things that we know about trees, how solid they are, if they have gaps or light shining through. There is a lot. And I mean a lot that we can do to create a really beautiful painting. And you can see already that the depth of the purple is helpful. Just making it seem like the tree is dense. Yeah. If you, yeah, if you just do it with these little dab pulls, what can happen is that it just sort of looks patchy. We don't want no patchy tree. Right? No. Sometimes I'm grabbing a little bit of the purple just to darken my red some. When I come up to these little reminders that I want to do something, I'm going to come here and I may give myself a little round of dots. And you can kind of see what I've done is I've created an arc up, down, and up. See that arc yeah. up, down, and up. Let's begin the process of the little dots. And you can see here at the edges, they're much more open. That's a couple of things. I'm leaving room to put in different colors of fall leaves. And I'm also making sure that I have a little room to extend it so that the delicacy of those spaces is well handled. Just dabbing that out. Isn't that fun? I like doing this. This painting, even without the fox, I think would be very lovely, in my opinion. I'm going to do something sort of similar here. It's going to come up, go down, maybe a little bit up and down again. I think like that, a little bit of a long, a long stretch. You know, and you can always... Take away some little leaves that have wandered their way away. Right? Yeah. See how I'm just pulling using the tip of the brush and I'm just touching it down and pulling it back? That's how I'm getting that nice leaf texture. If I need to turn my canvas like this, even though it's upside down, it can really help me get a good angle for what I'm trying to do. And it is important that when you're painting, you turn the surface, not yourself. Right? 
If you're painting at a table, make sure that you're paying attention to your posture and your back. Because if you don't, you can be really, really hurt. Hmm. I think I can do the rest from here on an upright. And I'll always be thinking about that. I'll always be like, what can I do from here that would be good? Maybe like that. Again, the stroke just works easier as a pull stroke by tapping the brush and pulling, and that's why you see me switching around my surface to get a better angle. And I hope that will encourage you to perhaps switch around your surface to get a better angle. Sometimes we always all need a better angle on the stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, the center of the tree is darker, so I'm going to mix a darker than I've been using red. You know what I'm doing? Yep. Just to show the depth of the tree. It's lighter than the purple underneath, but it's a pretty dark red, so it's giving us some, some contrast and some interesting thought. Now that I'm here, I can still pull because I want to pull towards towards me here. So there we go. You can really see the difference between the pure cad red and the docks purple pretty easily. If you want to. Isn't that fun? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. That works so well. Kind of centering all there. Okay. That's the end of step two within the tree. The next part of this that we're going to be going to is in the lighter colors. Remember, if you're having trouble with any of this, to check the website, extra references, extra step-by-steps are there to help you, and it really will make a difference in your outcome. I'm going to continue on with my number four round from the Art Sharp line, but now I'm going to get to move into some really fun colors. I'm going to get to move into my orange. Sometimes it helps to sort of half-step it with just a little bit of CAD red medium into your CAD red light. A lot of times people are confused by CAD red light because it looks like a very deep fall orange, but actually it is technically a red. I'm going to just continue popping this here. And so you can kind of see, that yes, it is brighter than what's there for sure, but it's much closer than you probably thought. I like to make sure that I leave little bits of the red I'm already doing now. And just continue to pull pretty little leaves. Do you like the little pretty leaves, John? I do. I like how when they layer up, they it looks more like the tree has depth. The tree, yeah, the tree is a deep tree. It's a deep thinking tree. Yeah. Oh, so much fun. If you live in an area of the country where there's fall colors, I imagine you are surrounded with so much inspiration. You must be just itching to be creative about it. Hopefully, this will help you do that. Now I'm going to bring this around here. I just really like to get these on the outside edges. Oop. Like making little tiny leaves. That little delicate touch is a big deal. The size of brush strokes is a very big part of the expression of your painting. Having big ones and little ones. And the direction and the way that they flow, you can see how there's almost a little curve to each time I do the pull. It gives a sense of things being in motion. And I like to describe that to new students because these are things that a beginner can do right now. A beginner can absolutely do today to make their painting look much more sophisticated and finished, even if they're really new to art. 
Then you're going to come here. You can see those little turns to the leaves. And maybe we'll go. Whoop. As I go, I just keep trying to create that depth. Onions have layers. Ogres have layers. You know what we need? No. We're going to need some bubbles soon. It's true, we are. We're going to have to get some bubbles going. I think it's... We'll check it. See what the status is. I are think over. when we finish our tree, we should celebrate with a few bubbles. Texas maybe snowflakes. Maybe, maybe we'll do bubbles. Maybe we could bubble. We could bubble. That's definitely celebratory. We need a celebratory bubble. You got to celebrate the wins in your painting. So when we get this all the way done, we'll do a big little celebration moment. It's real easy to get so caught up in the construction and trying to do all the techniques correct and everything right in the painting. You forget to congratulate yourself on your accomplishments and your wins. So if I can do anything to help encourage you to really, really see yourself and how great you're doing, that would be wonderful. This painting seems like it's a... Uh, would be really easy for anyone who was just starting out. It is. I would say the hardest thing for a new artist with this painting is just hanging in through the layers because acrylic paintings have a super crazy phase yeah. where they just look like no matter what you do, it's never going to be okay. But actually, they do this weird thing in the last third where all that hot mess comes together and all of a sudden it's a stunner. It's like every 80s movie you ever saw where the girl takes the ponytail out. Mm -hmm. All your acrylic paintings are that girl with the ponytail. So, you know, give her time. Believe. Believe in your art. I know that's hard because it's pretty much like believing in yourself. And believing in ourselves is maybe one of the most challenging things we ever do. You can see I can still make the stroke if I hold my brush upright. I may bring a few of these leaves towards the center, but I do like to keep them really in the outside. Again, playing with that depth of tree. I really like this tree, John. Me too. I cannot wait to see everybody's tree online. So many ways to share with me. You know, definitely come by the Facebook group or share online. But remember, you can also come by this video page and leave a comment and a picture of your painting. So not only I can see it, but other people who are trying this painting for the first time can see it and they'll have a good idea of what to expect. That's looking pretty good. Now, I might want to add just a few of the orange towards the center, but not that many. Just so it sort of blends, like it's believable that there's these little leaves, we don't want a hard line. We want an indescript line, if that makes sense. Yeah. All right. That is the end of stage two of the tree. So next we're gonna go on to stage three and highlight some of those leaves, making it look like some sunlight caught them and they're shimmering like tree glitter. Now, at this stage, it is important if you haven't done it already and you're sitting at a table or you're really up close in your working space to start to get into habit to stand four to six feet back, get back from your painting and look at it. Artists don't just do that to look like they're interesting. It actually helps them to take in the whole piece because when you're really up on it like we are here, all you can see is the flaws and mistakes. But if you want to start seeing how it's all playing together, the full composition, getting a little distance will help you a lot. To get my next color, which is going to be a really light yellow and orange, I'm going to take a little bit of my cat red light and come mix it with my yellow. And I want a very, very light color here. Something that's definitely going to stand out from the leaves and things underneath. You can see that I'm just popping this on and it does a really nice job 
of giving some extra little zhuzh to everything. I enjoy it very much. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way it implies that these little trees have a have sunlight or something coming out of them. Powerful, powerful stuff. Bring it in a little bit. Now as I come back, I will not put out the leaves as thickly because I'm trying to just imply that there's some light getting to these outer edges. Gotcha. Bip is a very helpful noise that you can make. <laughs> bip, bip, bip. <sighs> so I think, I don't know, you know, where you are or what you're doing at home, but I like to imagine myself, and I know John does, uh, imagining that we're right there with you. Yep. And something I would like to say is that I don't care what anyone has ever said to you about art in the past, about you having talent or no talent. Whatever they bug they put in your ear, I want you to know that if this is something that you want, as long as you practice and you commit to each stage and you do the layers, you're going to get a painting out of it. This is real doable. And if you've ever just really wanted to paint, all you've got to do is come with me and follow these steps. And you will be painting. I think it's important to know that you have that in you. Yeah. We've been doing this a minute. <laughs> and you can just see this little orange and yellow. Now, you might not know this already, but yellow is a very transparent color. It just is almost like putting cellophane on your surface. So you might find that your yellow is giving you a little bit of grief. Don't worry. Don't fret. The next thing that we're going to do is going to fix that. But I just want to make sure first that I have lit my outer edges of my tree with these gorgeous light orange leaves. And then we're going to do a spectacular what on the next stage. But let's finish up this one. Just to make sure. Oh, isn't that just beautiful? I love it. Oh, I'm, I'm hoping right now whoever's painting with us are loving their painting at home. Look at this. This is great. And you'll notice I'm doing that same thing where I put the color on, but I widen it out. Now rinse out, and then for the next stage, we're going to add a final, very light highlight that's going to pop this and pull it together, okay? All right. All right. Your tree is pretty gorgeous right now, but believe it or not, we can elevate that gorgeousness. So I'm going to go ahead and dip my brush in water. I'm going to make sure that I've rinsed out any pigment in it. So I want as clean of a color as I can get. I rinse in water. I'm going to go ahead and get my yellow out. I'm going to do something really fun. I'm going to get some white into it. And this is going to make a very bright, light, highlighted leaf. I'm going to come here, turning my surface to the side. Look at that. Wow. Now, I will tend to pick the topish of my branches when I do it and the stuff that is blowing out far, because that helps me show the light that's coming on. Be careful. Try to treat this like chili paste. A little is a lot. A little is a lot. If you ever get too much yellow, remember you can just come back with a little bit of orange and look, blend it out. I missed you get the orange. Right here. Like where I have a little too much yellow, that's what I do. I get a little bit of orange. Oh, I see. To soften it out. So it's real easy to keep control of. But even if it gets away from you just a titch, don't fret. 
I think this is going to have a nice little... I'm just making the smallest little leaves. Yeah. That's something to pay attention to when you're doing trees, decorative trees, realistic trees, is being able to get yourself some nice small brush strokes and then being able to in a controlled way pressing just a small bit harder with your brush bigger mm. just really helps out this is going to help the contrast composition and even the energy and flow of your piece will be improved by what we're doing here I like to look at it and then come back and return it on its side again. And let's definitely make sure that we are adding those highlights where we would want them. Those highlights are awesome. They do, they just pull it all together. Paying attention to the little leaves that may want to disperse or go or have a little expression. And you can see I'm just making sure that whatever of these that I have, as I'm coming in, there's less of them. They're there. But there's not so many that it becomes the whole piece. And I look at the whole thing and think to myself, what, what does it need? Now, at this stage, I can do a really fun thing. I can take, I think my orange would be the best choice here. My cad red light. Yeah. I'm going to turn my little surface to the side, and I'm going to make a little line that's blowing off. Oh, yeah. A little accent leaf. Just a little, just a few. You know, that have left the tree and are going off somewhere to do little leaf things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> So after we get this done, the next stage will be to put in the tree and the bark and all of that. So let me capture this stage and I'll see you for the tree trunk guy. For this next part of this fanciful tree, I'm going to use my number four round and dark paint and build in these wonderful branches. And then I'm going to add the highlights and colors that imply bark. This can be a challenging stage for new artists. And the reason is is that brush pressure is difficult. And when I mean brush pressure, I mean if you're paint pressing on your brush lightly or hard. Lightly or hard. So being able to release the pressure that you're putting on your brush out through the tip is going to be your number one friend in helping you find the types of branches that you might be looking to do. I begin by just reintegrating to the trunk that I've already put down here. I may dip my brush in water. You'll see me doing that, bringing over a drop or two to help improve the flow of the paint. I'm going to come across here and I'm going to make a little branch and travel down and then up. Oh, that's not too bad, right? Oh, looks really good. When you see me rolling up my brush, what I'm trying to do is remove paint from it. If that isn't working, what I will do is squeeze it out with a towel and then just reload. I think we need an upward branch. Let's begin at the bend and curve it up and over. More water. It is very hard to know how to modify heavy body paint when you're new to art. And what I'll say is, is that as long as you follow the manufacturer's instructions for how much water you can add to thin your paint, yeah. you will be fine and it's perfectly acceptable to use water to thin your paint. 
So you can see that what I'm doing is I'm coming along I'm making a stroke and then I'm branching a branch off of each stroke. Nice long twiggly bit there. See how we do? Yeah. All right, that looks very branchy, doesn't it? So perhaps in the history of trees, we've never ever dealt with a tree that actually did these things, but our tree is, and that's all that matters. <laughs> I'm going to put out another little branch. It's going to come off just a little bit down below its friends right there. And it will wander out into this space as well. That's good. Yeah. Oh, I think that's a very pretty shaped tree. This is a good time to make sure that your trunk and your branches are all the shape and size that you want. And then as soon as you're done with this, you're going to need to dry it. So go ahead and give this a dry, and then we can put on the next stage of the trunk, which is the bark. Now, you're I want to put in the bark. And to do that, I'm going to do a technique that we refer to in art as dry brushing. And whenever you hear someone say dry brushing, all they're saying is there ain't a lot of water in my brush. That's it. It's not any more mysterious than that. So you'll notice we've been adding a lot of water. John, have I been adding a lot of water? Oh, yeah. Adding a lot of water to modify and improve the flow of my paint. But now that I want to have a bark texture, I'm going to want to stop doing that. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to grab first maybe a little bit of my orange and put it into my burnt sienna to warm that up and make that a kind of more fall orange brown. And I'm going to begin to come along the trunk of my tree, adding these very rough, see how rough they are? Mm -hmm. Brush strokes. Those are pretty rough. Sometimes I will get on the toe of my brush uh, I'll do that if there's not a lot of room in the branch or trunk. And I do want to leave a good amount of my, got just a little bit of water, but I do want to keep it mostly to a dry brush. You see, I'm just doing touching little bits. Pull that around there. And this is a rough, broken stroke. That looks pretty good. Yeah. Next, put your brush in the yellow ochre. Can you do a break here so I can just take a quick picture? Yeah. All right. So we're going to take this lighter color. And this is kind of our highlight. And I'm going to come to this edge and you can see that I'm very lightly, very lightly touching my surface, creating this bark highlight, which makes everything pop. Bring it along up here. Even with dry brushing, sometimes I will have to Thin the paint to get the result that I want. Just bring those little bark touches. Don't erase all the dark of your branches. You need that contrast for this to show, but you do want to make sure that whatever you're saying is your bark that you're carrying through the whole piece. Now, this is a good time to touch up anything that you think you need to do. And I see some black that I need to touch up. So I'm going to come along here. And 
anywhere you want to make sure that you have a nice dark value. This will help your tree branches really pop. Doesn't have to be everywhere. I like the contrast. That it, it does. It, it, it adds that really important little pop so you can see what you've done. You want to see what you've done, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. All right. So that is the tree. And for the next stage, we're going to put in our fox and then our grass. And that is going to be a lot of fun. Now to get the fox in, I'm going to have to do a couple of things. I'm going to have to lighten some of the area of the grass. I'm going to put in his little steps, which I will really, really explain. So the first thing, take a little bit of your yellow and your yellow ochre and make that very light grass, it can be helpful to get a little white into it. And make sure that you've got some of this lighter ochre grass around because we'll need to help the fox stand out of grass that he really honestly is designed to be camouflaged into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is... You know, we are, we are playing with nature here. And you can see I'm just bringing that through my grass. And it's really a nice thing because it helps make it even feel more fall. Now, the area under him is going to be quite dark. So this, as, we, as we blend the tree in. Isn't that terrific? Mm-hmm. That is just my favorite. You can always come back with a little brown and work some of your grass around in different values. It totally is made for that. And sometimes I like to bring just a little bit of it up from the bottom. Then I'm going to begin the process of what is the dark shadow of grass underneath him. So. Imagine that this grass is laying down a bit. We'll definitely exaggerate this once he's in, but it helps kind of imply that he walked into here from somewhere and that maybe he's d like resting here or here in a more yeah. intense capacity. And see how that's like pushed down into a shadow. All right. He's got a little burrow nest thing going. He does. So let's build the fox in. I'm going to freehand him in. But remember, you can use the traceable. Mm -hmm. And tracing is in no way cheating. It's why we put all those extra resources on the website. You can also reference just this part of the step-by-step, -step, the mini pull-out step-by-step to help you build and construct your fox. Mm. I'm going to use my glasses, John. All right. Yes. This is my new reality where I use my glasses. Okay. So the first part of the fox, I'm going to go ahead and grab my black paint. I'm going to come right here. And it's sort of interesting. I'm going to build a little mound. See that little mound? Mm -hmm. That is kind of his back down to his haunches. People often don't think about that. And then from that little mound, I definitely want to put out a bit of a tail. See how we did there? Yep. So that is the first part of building him. So after that, we need to start to put in his face and his neck and the rest of his body. And I find that it can be nice to kind of bring a little line back. Just so I know where that's going to be. I'm going to begin painting in the shape of his skull, which I know sounds a little grim, but I promise it's not. Looks like an emu right now. Don't panic. <laughs> hmm. Right here. Dip the line down. Then the very long line to the snout. Pulling this back in. A lot of what will happen with this will happen when we put the fur on him. Oh, yeah. That's when he will start to really be himself. 
And the other important big shapes that I've got to remember are the big ear and the little forward ear. Yeah, you know, it's like he's listening in two directions like they do. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I've got to thin a thing out. Like, I feel like I did that black too thickly. All right. So that is the first part of painting in the fox. Now I'm going to start layering up the layers of his fur. And much like the tree, we're going to be doing it in stages and layers. So just try to pay attention to the direction that we're going and you'll be just fine. I'm going to get a little black into my brown. And I'm going to load it right on the tip of my brush here. This is the deepest color of his fur. And I'm going to come to his back here. And I'm going to make long fur strokes. These are very long lines begin to imply what you might think of as the direction of his fur. Mm. Right? So that's what we're doing. We're just making sure he seems super fluffy. And to do that, we've got to layer those things up. Other place that I want to layer these is through his tail. And the wonderful thing about a fox's tail is that you can be really kind of exaggerated about it and it will work out just fine. Mm. Now let's bring some fur back here. Coming back. We know that we've got the white rough. But for that to be able to layer over anything dark, we're going to have to paint it in to show that it's there. I'm going to work around the ears a bit. Just delicately. Mm. And then I'm going to definitely, definitely get an even smaller brush to do the, the little detail work that Mr. Fuzzy Fuzz thinks he's hiding out in the brown grass is gonna mm -hmm. love all right so dry your painting and i'll come back and show you the next step now i have a special brush this is called a number one monogram liner it's a small detail brush it's one of my favorites for doing uh small projects like this i'm going to take a little of my orange over into my brown and load up just a small amount and you're going to see me bring some fur And this gorgeous all around Mr. Fuzzy Pants. Mm -hmm. This is so relaxing and therapeutic. You will be blown away. If you remember to relax your shoulders and to breathe. Sometimes we forget to breathe when we're painting. And it can make us feel tense. But if you can just remember to let go and relax. Keep in mind, it's just art, and all you got to do is the layers. You will get a better painting than you expect if you commit to the layers. Let's turn this here, and I like to make sure that I'm using this bright cadmium into this brown. It's going to help the tail show. In the grass. Well, you will come back with a shadow too to help it continue to show. You totally do this. Be so fun. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Oh, this has been fun. You know, there is a question that just certainly has been overwhelmingly asked in chat. Hmm. What does the fox say? <laughs> I don't really know what the fox says, but my teenage daughter memorized it. <laughs> if she I, were I, here, we could ask her. I think it goes something like ring, ding, 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 ding. Oh, I did not know you spoke fox. I I don't, but I've I've heard their calls enough. Really? You you have two girls as daughters. They they dance a lot to the. To the, the song? To the song. I'm so, grabbing a little bit of dark paint so I can come underneath the tail and 
right at where the tail joins the body just to create a bit of a shadow it'll be helpful in in showing the shape of things if that makes sense yeah we do have uh an, enough daughters to to be up for the dance party yeah and i'm just not committed enough to the song to sing you know the wah pop 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 part in my hard falsetto at the top of my lungs because that's just you got to be really committed to get into that song you the know. girls are committed. Yeah, they are. But and anything that takes them away from Frozen, I'm happy about. Yeah. By, by the time you get to the fourth stanza of Fox, I mean, if if you're not shouting it and jumping up and down, you're just not committed to that song. That might be true. Now, Which I'm is, going to bring yep. this here, and I'm going to bring this highlight up on the face, down the muzzle just a little bit. Hopefully, John can, I don't know how close you can zoom into that. As close as you'd like me to. Oh, very cool. Very close. That's what I would like. I'm going to bring this up the ear a bit. I don't want to take out all the dark inside the ear. And I definitely want to make sure I keep improving the flow. A little bit of this forward ear. There we go. And he's starting to show up, isn't he? It's amazing how he starts to take shape and form. I might want to add a little bit of that shadow back here that I added back in the tail. Just through here. You can see I'm helping him capture. And then it helps him fluff. And that's why sometimes I go in and I give myself just a little bit of give for what I'm doing. All right. So that is the next step on the fox. And hopefully you're seeing as we do this that if you just do the steps, you're going to get the painting. Right? So now I'm going to start putting on some highlights and getting those little details in. It's the details that pull him all together. It's those lightened guard hairs that are over his coat. So I'm going to take a little bit of this cad red light and I'm going to mix it with my yellow ochre and sometimes with some white and it's just going to help me get a lighter coat color. And let's come over the top and add some of these lighter colors to his little fox fur along his back. If ever I need a little orange to pull in there, I'll grab it. It's okay to do that on him because they are so bright. Mm -hmm. Just luminous, beautiful beings. And you know, This is where those details find their way in. Back into my burnt sienna. And just do the work of painting that in. You'll notice that often I'm grabbing a little drop of water. And I may turn him to the side just so that we can really, really see. What's happening in his tail. Sometimes I like to offload my brush if the paint on it isn't giving me the fine little lines that I want. You have the right to change things as you need to to make your painting work for you. And I think it's important to feel like you can come back. I'm grabbing burnt sienna. I'm grabbing all my little fur colors. I'm trying to make sure that I have a highlight at the top of the tail, and I may even get some white into this. 
just to help this highlight. Got a bit of a shadow. And then let's come here. Make sure I got all the good colors. There we go. And his fur gorgeous. And go ahead and tap in a little fur around that ear. I think it's important to make sure that you've got a good highlight going on the top of his head. And on the inside of his ear. Isn't he cute? Now get some of your black paint. And we're come and we're gonna do the nose, which is very, very narrow on the muzzle. The muzzle's quite narrow. I also like to take this time. Come in and right here below that little bump that's a brow, put in the small shape that will be his eye. And I'll take this up just to exaggerate the little shapes that he's got going. This is a good time to check him and check the fur and make sure you're really happy with how he's looking in the dry grass. Now I'm gonna come in with my number four round and I'm gonna get my burnt sienna, definitely some of my orange. And I'm gonna make a very bright brown. And I'm gonna make sure that overall, even with his highlights, he has a strong, sense of being that red fox brown. Just verifying that. So it looks a little wild around here and how we take it from where he is to where you want it to be is we're gonna get some white paint and I like to put a little yellow ochre in it so it's not just bright, bright white. And we're going to come under the muzzle and inside the ear and we're going to make his little white markings. You know what we're doing? Yeah. Bring it a little bit forward on the eye. And then as we come down the neck, you're going to definitely want to turn that stroke. There we go. He's starting to look like himself himself. I like to bring this little white into the ear. Just to show that fur. I'm going to come get a little bit of my yellow and a little bit of my orange. Make a very bright yellow orange. 
that's just almost luminous and I get it right on the tiny tip of my brush and I'm going to come in here delicately as I can put in that bright spot it's kind of wild isn't it yeah sometimes that delicate work can be really challenging when you're new it does get easier with practice I'm going to go ahead and how I get this very delicate inner eyes I just barely touch okay now we have a pupil And I'm going to go ahead and get some just white on my brush. This is that next like level of just white. Mm -hmm. And this is super interestingly challenging. I'm going to try to get a reflection on the eye. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> it is always a little more challenging for me to get that. I'm going to go ahead and add some highlights to the the fur that he has and also it never hurts to make him even furrier right what does the fox say he says I'm furry <laughs> and I'm just checking the, the shadows and everything that are shaping his body so that we have the nice little kind of curled up looking back sort of face to us and then if I need to come back with a little bit of black to tone down my reflection I will and I sometimes have to do that because you want to see the eye but you don't want the eye to be so bright that it takes over the whole piece sometimes a little reflection on the nose is helpful And any last little guard hair details that you want to do. It's a good time to do. Yeah. There we go. Isn't he nice? If you felt like it, you could give your fox blue eyes. You could. You could give your fox any color eyes that you want. But now all we have to do is sort of finish the grass just a little bit around him and we're done. All right, so now we're at the finishing stages and we want to do a couple of things. First, we want to make sure the shadow underneath him has enough depth in its value that he stands out against where he is. So I'm going to get a little blue and I'm going to get a little black and I'm going to come sort of underneath his little tail and add a bit of a shadow right here. Deep in that shadow. See how we did? Yeah. So we can really see his tail and really see where he is. And once that's done, I'm going to come back and get some of my yellow ochre, maybe some of my white, making my end of summer dry grass color. I'll make some delicate little bits of grass that come around him. And maybe even go up to make him seem like he's hidden even more. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. That last little touch really pulls that in. When I was a girl, my mom did a lot of animal paintings. And she would always hide things in the paintings for me. And I remember just sitting and looking for all the secret treasures. <laughs> and you can do that for yourself. You know, hide a little magic in your life. Not everything in your painting has to be like super duper obvious sometimes it's wonderful to discover something within it now yeah. all that's left john you know what is signing but you know what we never did what'd you do bubbles <gasps> bubbles 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 oh there we go we did forget him a little bit in the middle but it's a wonderful way to end this piece let's give this a signature while the texas snowflakes fly i'm gonna get my orange paint and come right here and just sign my name. 
try to think about how I sign so that what I'm doing doesn't disrupt the composition of the piece. All right, let's take that in. That was a ton of fun and I really appreciated showing you how you could make this painting. I really love helping you people paint and if you had fun, check out one of the other many, many hundred free painting tutorials. We have them at all levels and all interests. There's so much for you to do. John and I really, really appreciate your time. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Be good to yourself. Be good to each other. And I want to see you at an easel really soon. Bye-bye.